sir i informed our hod sir just a minute sir yeah yeah sure ma'am yeah okay I think, sir, yes, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. Sir, join. Yes. Sir, good morning, sir. Good morning, all. Welcome to all the participants to this webinar. May we move to the first point in the agenda, the welcome address. May we request the director, Office of Alumni Relations, Dr. Ganesh, to kindly deliver the welcome address. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, once again, uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, Mr. Nawaz Khan, uh, Crescent Elements B Tech IT 2010 Batch Senior Engineer, Airline San Francisco and US. Uh, so, Dr. I Sadiq Ali, HOD Department of Information Technology, Mr. John Matthew and Lakshmi, Associate Professor, Alumni and Faculty Members, Guests and My Dear Students. On behalf of Office of Alumni Relations and Department of IT uh, Information Technology, an immense pleasure to welcome our elements, uh, Nawaz Khan. So normally we do it in a physical mode uh, due to pandemic, uh, we are in a virtual. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Namaskan, for your time uh, to spend with our uh, uh, students today. Uh, definitely it will be a very interactive session. I hope uh, it's, it's very useful for our students. Uh, I think the topic itself is just too technical. Maybe uh, our students get benefited. Uh, I request one second, uh, all the faculty members the warm welcome from our uh, Sadiq sir. Uh, without uh, his support, we cannot do anything uh, for the departments and the uh, alumni coordinators and all that. Uh, definitely, I request uh, Nawaz to visit uh, when he was in uh, India. You can just visit our university. We are very active in uh, US chapter. Uh, we are trying to add uh, some more uh, chapters in uh, US, some part of uh, North and the East. So our pro chancellor. Uh, uh, have a vision to expand some for the US chapter. So we are very active from Office of Alumni Relations uh, from the university point of view. Definitely we'll keep in touch with you for uh, further uh, communications and all that. We have a lot of uh, uh, alumni interactions. We have, do a lot of activities for the alumni. I request our, uh, you to connect always with our university uh, staff member. I think uh, you have connected with all of our uh, uh, faculties and students. Uh, so that's a, a very uh, support from you. Uh, you can support for any uh, technical uh, anything uh, from uh, request from our side. You can connect even your friends. Uh, you can connect. Uh, we are going for a, a live very shortly with the completely. We are going for a alumni uh, completely for the softwares we are making now. Uh, it's, it's in the end of the implementation. Once it's ready, so we are planning to connect all the global uh, uh, network with all the our students of, who have passed out uh, from that. We are also planning for a December uh, global alumni meet. Definitely, if everything is fine, the pandemic, definitely we'll uh, invite you for, uh, definitely for uh, uh, some uh, kind of uh, details or anything. Uh, thank you so much. I don't take much time of you. Uh, I think uh, Sar is here. Uh, Sadi Ali sir, so I request uh, uh, to deliver the uh, address to the students. Uh, thank you so much once again, ma'am. Uh, alumni coordinator Lakshmi and uh, yes, sir, uh, John Matthew. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, have a good day, sir. I request all the students to end of the session. You can have a question and answers. You can directly ask them. Uh, put in the chat box. We can interact. He is our uh, alumnus. So not from any other industries or anything. So we can in, make it uh, more interactions so that it's very uh, useful for our students. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ensign. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Now move to the next point in the agenda. The, may I request the uh, HOD IT, Dr. Sadi Ali, to deliver the special address and the introduction of the department, please. Thank you, Dr. John Matthew. In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. Indeed, I join with our placement director, Dr. Ganesh, and our alumni coordinator, John Matthew, in welcoming Mr. Nawaz Khan for this wonderful webinar. First of all, I would like to convey my warm greetings to you all. Good morning, 
அஸ்லாம் வலைக்கம் வணக்கம் ஈன்ற பொழுதின் பெரிதுவக்கும் தன்மகனை சான்றோன் என கேட்டத்தார் திஸ் இஸ் தர்ட் ஆஃப் அவர் பிலவுட் கிரேட் பாயட் திருவள்ளுவர் இண்டீட் ஐ ஃபீல் ஸோ டுடே பிகாஸ் யூனோ ஃபார் ஸ்டூடெண்ட்ஸ் டீச்சர்ஸ் ஆர் செகண்ட் பேரண்ட் இன் தமிழ் மாதா விதா குரு தெய்வம் ரைட் say in this context department feels proud of you having you in this wonderful seminar earlier you are learning from the department now department starts learning from you that is a cycle arsa okay so here i would like to give the explanation of indra bolidin peridivakam tanmaganai sandrone na ketta because you know most of us nowadays you know forget tamil but we are not that doesn't mean that we are wonderful in different languages we are poor in other languages too so here whenever your mother hears that her son being called as a wise man she will rejoice more than when she gave birth that is the meaning okay i would like to say in tamil also because you know we all are from tamil nadu most of the students also from tamil nadu for the benefit of tamil speakers i would like to say this because you know nowadays we talk much about technology techniques this and that that what is put at the back burner is the discipline you know uh, moral any education system without religious thoughts and thinking can create only clever devils this is one of the wonderful quote i ever enjoy so for the benefit of other students let me say the explanation of the same tirukural in tamil oru thai vande thanudaiya kulandai petterukumbodu she be more happy illaya avaru endha oru thaiyume thanudaiya kulandai petterukumbodu that is the wonderful time அந்த அம்மாக்கு வந்து அதான் வந்து பெஸ்ட் டைம் தட் மச் ஆஃப் ஹாப்பி அந்த அளவுக்கு அந்த அம்மா வந்து என்ஜாய் பண்ணுவாங்க பட் வாட் அல்வர் சைஸ் இஸ் அதே தாய் தன்னுடைய மகனை வந்து சிறந்த அறிவாளி என்று உலகம் சொல்லும் போது அதே தாய் அதை விட அதிகமாக மகிழ்ச்சி கொள் கொள்கிறார் திஸ் இஸ் வாட் இன்னொரு திருவள்ளுவர் சைஸ் அண்ட் ஆல்சோ ஐ லைக் டு சே அனதர் இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் பாயிண்ட் ஃப்ரம் திருவள்ளுவர் கோட்ஸ் தமிழ் பெரியார் தமரா ஒழுகல் வன்மையுள் எல்லாம் தலை வாட் ஹி சேஸ் யூனோ இன் எவ்ரி வாக் ஆஃப் லைஃப் தெர் ஆர் யூனோ பெட்டர் பீப்புள் ஆர் யூனோ லோயர் பீப்புள் அண்ட் ஆன் ஆல்சோ யூனோ த பீப்புள் ஆன் பாதி அவர் ஓன் லெவல்ஸ் ஸோ இன் ஆர்டர் டு கம் அப் இன் அவர் லைஃப் வாட் திருவள்ளுவர் சேஸ் இஸ் தமிழ் பெரியார் தமரா ஒழுகல் வன்மையுள் எல்லாம் தலை ஸோ வி ஹவ் டு ஐடென்டிஃபை பிக் பீப்புள் ஆர் வைஸ் பீப்புள் ஆர் எல்டர் பீப்புள் then you have to follow them if you do so you will come up in your life okay che uh, this and all you know you and me have learnt in our school days but what is the pathetic story of that is you know we learnt and forgot but these are not the things to learn and forget but this is the words we should practice in our day okay you know as long as the world is there centralized versus decentralized monolithic versus polylithic monoism versus polyism all this you know uh, you know uh, these things you know will be happening here and there you know sometimes you know centralized will be better sometimes you know decentralization will be better some you know, sometimes you know centralized government is better sometimes you know decentralization is better all these things you know will come and go but what we ever live is the constant belief in the moral values and the ethics what we put forth in our technology as well as you know uh, in our every walk of life that will be constant you know technology today will say one thing tomorrow the same you know technology will change it. say i have seen many thing like that in my you know 25 years of career i have learned much like that you know 
even fashion is like that you know one day you know collar will be you know short the next uh, season your know, collar will be long again collar will become short all these things will come and go but what is constant is we all should be a human being that is constant that's what i would like to say hey you know today i hope you know all our students uh, will enjoy rearchitecting friend and mono repos with uh, graphql and edge service i hope you know mr nawaz khan our alumnus of our crescent institute as well as you know particularly department of it he passed out in year 2010 now he is working as a senior engineer everland san francisco california right i hope you know i hope and i expect i pray the almighty allah almighty god uh, this kind of achievement for all of our students not only of the it students but also for the entire crescentians may the almighty god bless all the faculty members and students and our alumnus not only in this world but also the world uh, life hereafter okay thank you very much for the opportunity given i thank you know dr lakshmi and all the faculty members our uh, placement coordinator and uh, alumni coordinator the uh, uh, all one and all who gave me the opportunity okay, thank you very much for Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We now move to the next point on the agenda: the introduction of the alumni. May I request Dr. Lachomi, Associate Professor, IT Department, to kindly introduce the alumni. Yeah, thank you, John, sir. Uh, I am very happy to introduce our beloved alumni, Mr. Nawaz Khan, a senior engineer at Everland. Uh, he did his schooling in S U I M at the High Secondary School, Chennai. and computer is btech uh, it at crescent engineering college university in 2010 and did his master of science at university of texas at dallas united states in 2013 uh, he started his career as a product engineer at subhub and had experience around 4 years at subhub uh, then he worked as a senior product engineer at jun labs washington united states around 2 years Uh, there he re-platformed uh, and launched the new Jun 2.0 e-commerce site with React and Ruby on rails, and also he lead the digital growth initiatives course launch in Jun Labs. He is currently working as a uh, he he is currently working as a senior engineer at Everland from October 2019. Uh, he revamped and launched a brand new mobile site uh, with a modern stack uh, GraphQL server. Uh, next day is and cloud uh, player workers uh, he is also an active member in various bodies like a fellow on uh, sir at on deck at san francisco uh, a mentor he is also acting as a mentor at ada developers academy us and uh, board member at uh, program equity uh, us and also he is a public speaker um, about web and fun engineering actually i really impressed about this particular point public speaker <laughs> Uh, he is specialized in various languages for web and fun engineering like HTML5, uh, JavaScript, and SAS. Uh, syntactically awesome uh, style sheets. Uh, the one more important thing is he has also published a paper titled OCS, a system for optimizing clustering and summarizing of web search results using intelligent agents in IEEE International Conference on Intelligent Agent and Multi-Agent Systems in 2009 during his undergraduate studies. Okay, uh, I uh, I welcome uh, uh, Mr. Nawaz Khan for this uh, webinar. Uh, yes, I uh, now uh, hand over the session to the Nawaz Khan. Please, Nawaz Khan, take over the session. Yeah, th thank you so much, Madam. Thank you so much for the uh, wonderful introduction, and uh, thank you, uh, Ganesh sir, John sir, and uh, Hachodi sir, uh, for uh, for the warm welcome. I'm I'm beyond excited. today to like talk with all of you um and uh, i'm also like feeling very very nostalgic so um thank you for uh, when coming to this talk today um uh, let me share my screen first and uh yes okay uh can you guys see my screen okay Yeah, I think it's yeah, Sharon. Okay, great. So, um, 
So my talk is going to be about uh, re-architecting front-end mono repos with GraphQL and Edge servers. So uh, even though the title looks very uh, technical, I'm going to like break it down into digestible pieces. Uh, so uh, as we go, you'll see like uh, it's it's very simple actually. It's it's not like uh, it sounds very technical, but but like it, it's super digestible. So my name is Nawaz Khan and my Twitter handle is I am underscore Nawaz, so you can follow me there. So uh, like Madam said, I'm a senior engineer at Everlane. So for those who don't know what Everlane is, uh, it's basically a fashion company. So like uh, Sadiq Ali Sar said, I think the colors go long and short as time goes. So um, my company basically does all those things. And uh, one cool thing that happened was um, I got to like model for my company uh, during the pandemic. So, so basically uh, this picture was on marketing emails and home pages and all those things. That was, that was like a very fun part that I had working at a fashion company. So um, at a fashion company, you, you may ask, okay, so what, what is, why is engineering so important, right? So, um, we have this online e-commerce website. Uh, you can go to www.everlane.com and uh, the whole engineering architecture, the tech stack is all built in-house. So we're not using Shopify or anything. So if you want to make any changes to anything, we can do it immediately without waiting for um, like Shopify to integrate anything. So it's all built in-house. And... Uh, our company is based in San Francisco. That's the HQ. And uh, the, the difference between um, like why I like working at Everlane is because in this world, most of the clothing is, uh, is fast fashion. So one, in one year, there, like, there's so much um, waste that is being produced by the fashion industry. Um, clothes are being discarded. Whereas uh, Everlane takes a very different approach. Uh, we, uh, we focus on transparent pricing. So the people who are working in the industry get like fair wages. And uh, we focus on ethical and, and sustainable manufacturing. For example, uh, we use recycled uh, like, uh, like existing plastic bottles and we make clothes out of it. So, um, uh, and as you, as you guys know, like global warming and all those things are like, uh, are like huge right now. So Everlane takes a major stance on that issue. And I'm, I'm extremely proud to be part of that. Uh, yeah, go check out uh, everlane.com and uh, you'll see all the work that um, I have done and my colleagues have done. So, okay. And yeah, outside of work, uh, I like to make doses. I'm a, I like to cook. I'm a coffee connoisseur. Uh, I like photography. These are some of my hobbies that I do outside of my day-to-day uh, -day work. So breaking the monolith. Uh, I would like to actually take a, a poll here. Um, how many of you have worked? Uh, how many of you know what a monolith is? Like, if you guys can just like, you know, um, just say yes or like just comment on the chat, how many people have worked on a monolith before, or like know what a monolith is? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna assume, um, I'm, just, I'm just gonna describe it anyway. So uh, a monolithic architecture is basically uh, when, when you start a new code base, when a company is uh, started, uh, what happens is, um, we all create the front end, the back end, and all the code goes into one GitHub repository. And, uh, and we just keep adding code to the same one as time goes. And everything is being maintained in this one giant monolithic code base. So that is what a uh, monolith is. And uh, we're gonna be talking about like breaking it and why it is important. The reason why this talk is important to me is because I have worked at multiple e-commerce companies in my career. And the one common thing uh, between each of them is that um, like everybody has 
the same issue where everybody's code base is all in this one giant GitHub repository. And uh, it's very hard to like uh, push code, manage it, maintain it as time goes on. Uh, initially, it's much easier because when you start out, uh, you don't have uh, any um, issues of scaling or anything. Um, and you can just like get some product outside. But as time goes on, as the company has to scale more, it becomes a huge hassle, right? So, um, and each one of the companies that I've been part of, uh, we have tried to make the code base performant, modular, and purpose oriented. And uh, most of the time, the the decoupling and uh, and tying the systems together, like the architecture part, is left to the software architects of the company, like the principal architects. So they decide, okay, what is the arch new architecture uh, going to look like, and how is it going to scale? And uh, not a lot of engineers, like uh, like junior engineers. Uh, like even sometimes senior engineers, they don't get to like be part of the re-architecture. Uh, but through this talk, like using edge servers and uh, GraphQL, uh, my idea is to democratize this knowledge so that uh, a lot of people can actually learn it. The knowledge doesn't have to be contained only with the principal architects of companies. So that's why this talk is so important to me. And uh, what is a monolith? A monolith, or it's interchangeable with monorepos. A monolithic code base is basically a repository where every piece of code is written and managed. And uh, like I said, the UI, the backend, the DB migrations, the configurations, everything is maintained in one place. It's like this giant piece of stone here. Like it, it looks very, very harmless. But as time goes on, we will find more issues. So before I into this talk, I have to like establish some important dates. So Everlane was founded in uh, 2010 uh, by our CEO, Michael Praisman. And uh, during 2010, the technology landscape was very different to what it is today. So jQuery was the most popular library on web. And uh, Backbone JS was this uh, MVC framework uh, for UI that was created to um, to like build uh, robust robust UI components and things. And uh, it was like very in very early stages. And React JS, if you guys have uh, like dabbled with React, it was not even released back then. The initial release was in two two thousand thirteen. And today, React.js is like a very common name, and uh, it has surpassed jQuery. So we have come a very, very long way. And uh, the backend code of Everlane was written using Ruby on Rails and a few other um, components, also, like frameworks also existed during that time. And uh, JavaScript has clearly leapfrogged to a whole new level today in the past decade. Right. So today, like we use React and like so many other uh, new frameworks are there in the industry. So when I joined Everlane, the code base had all these frameworks like together, all in one place. Everything uh, was working uh, to do something similar, but everything coexisted. For example, Backbone was there, CoffeeScript was there, uh, Redux was there and Ruby, embedded Ruby templates was there. All these were like just, all these were existing just to maintain the UI. So as a new engineer, this is how I felt. Like it was very hard to understand, okay, what is going on here? I, I just don't understand this code because if I have to understand this, I have to like go deeper and find out, okay, what is happening? And it takes such a long time to understand the code and develop a new feature uh, and uh, push it out in front of the customer. So the code was a spaghetti and there were a lot there was a lot of technical debt involved. The feature development time took like two to three times longer than it should have taken. And uh, if you touch one thing, a uh, one point in the code base, 
something else breaks on the other other side, which you are not aware of, and uh, until you go to production, and then you find out something is wrong. Uh, so that's called a side effect. And uh, deployment times. So when when a code is changed, uh, what happens is we have this continuous integration and continuous deployment, which runs all the tests and checks to make sure the code is fine before pushing it to production. So the deployment times take longer because all the front end tests run and the back end tests run, even though the change that I pushed was just meant for uh, one small front end stuff. So we don't have to run like the whole back end and everything, right? So, uh, but since everything was maintained in just one repository, uh, it still runs everything together before pushing into production. So it was like very difficult for me and this is how I felt. So why does this problem exist in exist in the first place? Like why do all these companies uh, you know, have this problem? It's mainly because all these companies have been there for quite some time um, and uh, technology was like very different and it was very easy to build a monolith to begin with um, and uh, just like keep stacking features on top of each other until you get to a certain point where you just like break everything down and there's like no way to like move further. And uh, uh, companies take this like easy route. I think, I think initially it is fine. It is valid. Okay, uh, we can go take this route, but as time goes on, it's, uh, it's very essential for us to like make sure our, our uh, code base is uh, performant, robust and modular. Um, and uh, it's uh, it allows us to scale as we need. So, so uh, so we we'll, we live in a time where technology gets outdated, also very quickly as we speak, and uh, startups uh, have this advantage of uh, having this new code base with like modern technologies and are able to scale rather quickly. And uh, giant companies like just like watch them. Uh, and uh, they are trying to like make sure uh, they are also like equipped to take on any startups. So it's highly important to make sure our uh, our code base that we use for uh, in our company is is highly performant, and it follows like um, like like high like good coding standards and all those things. So after spending some time looking at it. Um, we decided, okay, uh, it is time to make a move. We are not able to like scale it and maintain our code base. So we needed a very modular approach to our architecture where each module has the, ha like follows this thing called single responsibility principle. So each module is responsible for like only one thing. And, uh, and we have like multiple modules, uh, like all combined uh, together, but again, every single module should be responsible for just one thing. So that's like the underlying principle we wanted to follow. So we were like thinking about, okay, what kind of migration strategies can we adopt? Clearly we have to achieve scale and how, how should we do this? Uh, so we were thinking about a few strategies. One is, well, we have this, online e-commerce site running. Um, how about we just stop everything, rewrite the whole code base from scratch? Mm, like starting a whole new project on the side and just like write everything from the, from the scratch, right? Uh, who doesn't like a greenfield project? Like it's much easier to like create something from nothing rather than going in and, and like figuring out what is wrong. Um, but the thing is, like, it's very hard to get management buy-in. Uh, we can't just like create everything uh, from scratch, especially uh, if we have this huge code base. So it was not like a feasible approach for us. How about stopping and refactoring? Like, okay, uh, let's not push new features. Um, let's just like go in and fix whatever the existing bugs are. And then uh, we can like, once we are in a good state, we can like move forward. Uh, but the thing is, uh, 
a lot of engineers before me have already tried it. That is one of the reasons why multiple frameworks existed in the first place uh, when I came in. For example, the slide that I, sh that I showed that I showed you had Backbone JS, CoffeeScript, like React, Redux. They already tried this. It didn't work. Okay. So the last one was to rewrite it incrementally. Uh, this was very interesting for us because we don't we didn't we didn't have to stop everything and refactor or create everything from the scratch. But how about just making um, like making like a a portion of the e-commerce site work and uh, and keeping the rest of the portion like uh, like just like in the old code base and wire these things together so that we don't have to like create create everything from scratch just like one small thing from scratch like a piece of the uh, a piece of the website uh, and then as time goes on we can like something. add more on top of this hello yes nothing ever you can proceed Oh, okay. So, so we decided to rewrite our code base incrementally. So uh, one of the first things that we did was to gauge uh, what were the high impact pages, like the pages that got the most amount of traffic. Uh, so we decided to build the mobile part only, the mobile web portion only. Uh, so we decided, okay, homepage is getting a lot of traffic. Collection page is getting a lot of traffic, and the uh, product detail page is getting a lot of traffic. So, uh, how about we just uh, rewrite these pages from scratch and let all the other pages on the e-commerce site function like how it uh, it used to function today? Uh, and how can we do that? So that's the strategy that we took, and uh, so we didn't touch checkout. We only touched like the the left left portion in this slide. So uh, for you guys, this is how uh, our homepage collection and product detail page looks on the website. Uh, so we only like created these pages from scratch, okay? And the checkout page was like uh, just left alone, and we just like. Kind of like wired these new things with the old one so that we can come back to the old one later and work on it later so since we were like working on this anyways we also like took the liberty to update the designs and give the site a very modern look so last year like i said we had all these different frameworks coexisting and the code base being a spaghetti, uh, it's very, it was very hard to like maintain and manage and understand what's happening. Uh, so we moved from this to this. So the first logo is on the right side is GraphQL. The second logo is uh, this thing called Apollo. And the third one is React.js. So we kind of like moved away from the left side and we just moved to the right side. And we'll see how we did that. So the goal of the project, the goal of the re-architecture was, okay, so we need improved user experience. We need a very high page load performance. And we want to build a backend agnostic software architecture. So for example, we need to build an architecture where we don't care about what the backend is. We can, agnostic means we, we can basically plug in any kind of backend that we want later on. So we need to be in a position where um, like we have to create an architecture that allows us to do this. And some other non-goals we had was to achieve better code organization and also adopt GraphQL. So GraphQL is this, uh, just to give a, a short, uh, short thing about Gra GraphQL, GraphQL is, is this technology which allows us to pick and choose a particular set of data that the UI needs rather than 
um, like going back and forth and collecting multiple uh, data points and aggregating everything together and like 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 playing around with it so it's it's very inefficient we can we can save a lot of http calls and just use uh, in the browser we can just use one request and send in okay so this ui component requires this like five uh, like five data attributes just send us that uh, so all we can do that in just one request so it saves us a lot of time so the the team was comprised of like very uh, like scrap it was a very scrappy team of engineers designers and a pm we had like 4.5 months to do this and uh, we we launched the new site on july 6 2020 so some metrics so bef so black friday is this uh, day in uh, united states where people shop like crazy because of all the deals and everything so we get a lot of traffic especially on this like one particular day and uh, during this time frame approximately 50 percent of our traffic like 45 to 50 percent of our traffic was on the new stack that we built and it was able to uh, like allow a beautiful experience to all these users and a very performant experience to all these users that were coming in so um, the LCP here, LCP is called long, like longest contentful uh, paint. So the amount of time that uh, it takes for the browser to actually uh, paint the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, like image on, on a page. So this is what determines how fast the page loads. So uh, for example, Google has this thing called Google Web Vitals. Uh, and LCP is uh, one of the key metrics to decide, okay, if a site is performant or not. And uh, we actually went from 4.8 seconds to 2.6 seconds, which was a major achievement when we launched this. So this is an architecture diagram. I'll uh, go deep into this later, but to begin with, uh, the monolithic uh, sequence diagram looks like this. So there is a browser. And um, the, the Cloudflare that you see here, that is the edge server. So an edge server is basically, um, there are different servers, okay? Uh, one is your application server where you deploy, where you deploy the, uh, the working website, like for example, the backend code, front end code and all these things. And, and an edge server is basically like a uh, content distribution network uh, and Cloudflare is the name of the company which provides us the edge server and uh, it, it acts as a middleware between our application server and the browser. So all the requests flow through Cloudflare and then go to the application server and then they, uh, the, the response comes from the application server, goes through Cloudflare and the browser. Uh, so um, that's how the uh, existing, uh, the, the, old, the old monolithic sequence works. And uh, edge server is basically, it's a distributed set of uh, servers um, in, in the whole world. And uh, because of their, uh, um, their distribution in the world, it's uh, it's very close to us. For example, it's closer than the application server. Application servers don't have uh, that much distribution compared to uh, the edge servers. Uh, so uh, the edge servers are like the closest to the browser compared to the application servers. So the the time it takes for us to get the response from the edge server is actually faster. So we went from that to this kind of a sequence diagram. Like, so the, the request goes through Cloudflare and Cloudflare has this uh, thing called workers, which allows us to like write any code before we actually like pass the requests to the application server. We can programmatically do pretty much anything that we want uh, at the Cloudflare level. 
uh, weekend. So we had we created like two new uh, two new servers. Like one is we named it Web and Apollo GraphQL, and Monolith is basically the old server that we used to have. We will actually like take a look into this like a little bit later. I'll go a little bit deeper into this. But uh, how did it all start? Uh, it all started with the prototype. So we chose a technology called Next.js and uh, Apollo Server, and we used GraphQL, and we built uh, we built this all the uh, pages that I showed before, uh, the home, the collection, and the product page, and we created a prototype that can communicate with each other. So, so why Next.js and what is Next.js? So Next.js is basically a framework that is wrapped around React.js and uh, it actually gives a lot of benefits out of the box. So if you get a chance, go to Next.js on the website and uh, take a look at it. They have amazing like new uh, advancements in web technologies. And uh, if you're playing with uh, React.js, um, it's all like native, it's all um, in, in Next.js, so React is under the hood, out of the box performance benefits, and uh, it also gives us flexible rendering strategies. For example, when the HTML is coming back from the uh, from the application server, we can decide whether we are going to like generate the uh, the HTML on the server or on the client side, or they also like introduce this new thing called inc incremental static site generation so they have they have covered a ton of uh, new concepts when it comes to like uh, web technology so if you get a chance like totally totally go check it check them out and they also have a very vibrant community they're very popular so and also one other advantage was the code structure so we were already like dealing with uh, like uh, difficulties managing uh, like the code base efficiently. So uh, Next.js also like gave us this uh, ability to like structure our code in a way uh, where it, it made sense. For example, in this uh, code structure, we have a library for all the utilities and uh, uh, the contexts the context here, like they save the state of the application on the client side and the components um, is where we store all of our components, like let's say a header component or a footer component, all those things go there. And uh, the pages here store all the different pages on the site, for example, home collection and all those things. And we can also like write some uh, server side logic here. And the styles are also like maintained in a different folder. And uh, what is Apollo and why Apollo? Apollo is basically a, a syntax sugar for using GraphQL. Um, so it, Apollo is also another framework. Uh, go check it out. Uh, it has a, a huge set of packages. It has a client. Um, it has a, a server package, and it's super easy to like set up a GraphQL schema and connect it to uh, connect it with like a REST API. And uh, uh, it it also comes with a lot of latest caching strategies so which are like super exciting um, like there are strategies like cache only uh, network only and all those things uh, check them out and uh, um, they, they also have query optimizations so if if uh, if you want to refetch something that's also like super easy um, and uh, polling is also like uh, made very easy we don't have to like write any new code to achieve this so all these things are like like available as a part of the framework. So churning out, so we started like churning out new features for the for mobile um, as we were like building it using the frameworks that uh, I explained before. And uh, this time, as we were building new features, writing keying code was like extremely important. Um, so this time. We, we cannot make room for any mistakes like uh, how like our earlier application that we had. So we kind of like integrated these packages 
uh, in our code base. So ESLint basically runs on the code on all the JavaScript JavaScript code that we write, and it tells us, okay, these are all the mistakes, errors uh, that we have made, um, and uh, all those things happen as we type the code. We don't have to wait until we hit the production and find out. And style lint basically tell, like make sure that our our CSS are all uh, following the best practices. And uh, Husky and Git hooks are quite exciting. They actually um, set up a hook. So every time I commit a piece of code, um, Husky is basically a package which sets up the Git hook and it automatically runs these checks. So even before um, a continuous integration or a continuous deployment picks up, hey, this is wrong. Um, but as a developer, I can actually like see this on my local machine uh, every time I commit code. So uh, these are some things that we integrated in our code base to ensure we write clean code. And uh, keeping an eye on the performance from the get-go was extremely important for us. So uh, in this example, um, there are a couple of strategies that we adopted. One is using dynamic components and another one is using dynamic packages. So the first one on the left side is uh, using a dynamic component. Uh, so what happens is when we load a page, uh, as the page loads, as a component loads, only if a component is needed, then uh, then the browser will go and fetch, okay, so give me this component because this page needs it. So it is, this component is not a, not a part of the bundle itself. So when a page loads, uh, we load this, we load a JavaScript bundle and only if the page demands a component, then uh, we load a particular component until then we don't load a component. That is what is called a dynamic component. And the same goes for dynamic package as well. A dynamic package, for example, in this case, we're using a package called Braintree for our payment. So Braintree is a company and we use them for our payment processing. Um, and uh, only if a component or a page demands a certain package or a component, then the page goes and fetches it. So this saves us sizing. So the bundle size that loads initially on the page is very small. So it actually, uh, the page loads very quickly because of this. So performance was extremely important and keeping an eye on the performance from the get-go was extremely important for us. We also use something called intersection observer. Um, this was another interesting piece of uh, technology. So React Intersection Observer allows us to load uh, load components or images only if the image is uh, part of the viewport. So what is a viewport? A viewport is basically what you see on the phone. So this is what is called a viewport. So as we scroll, as we are looking uh, a, a a website as we are scrolling it. Um, if something is not a part of the web, the viewport, it won't load. For example, a footer, a footer is going to be at the bottom of the page, right? So we won't be loading the footer component until the user has scro has scrolled till the almost till the end of the page, and then uh, we pick up that oh, so we are close to the footer, so we should load the footer now. So until then, the footer doesn't load. So uh, it is, uh, it's quite interesting and fascinating. So uh, we use this one as well to improve our performance and reduce our bundle size, of course. And uh, another interesting thing about uh, using Next.js is that we, uh, we are able to see the bundle size, what is going to be loaded on every single page even before we hit the production. So uh, if we run the build, uh, we can do it 
on our local environment too. Uh, it will show us, okay, this particular page has the size of 3.73 KB and, uh, and the initial JavaScript bundle that loads has a size of 230 KB and all those things. Uh, these all look pretty big right now. Uh, not like too big, but like pretty big, but these all will be like minified and all those things uh, happen. But this is my, my local build that shows me, okay, this is how much the size of uh, the, the, the bundles are. So, and also it shows us, okay, which pages are server side rendered, statically rendered uh, and those kind of things. So we also chose Apollo client, Apollo because um, it was easier for us to adopt hooks. So React came up with this uh, with this thing called hooks. So before that, uh, React was using class components, and uh, it was it was not very JavaScripty. Like it was not feeling like, uh, like 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 modular or functional. So React basically made a shift to using hooks and uh, Apollo adopted the same things, for example. So in this, one second. So in this example, uh, we see a GraphQL query on the top. Uh, we are requesting uh, get cart using an ID and we send some attributes. And uh, if you see this, everything that starts with the word use is a hook. The use query, use session. So it's all like uh, based on functional components. And uh, we can uh, create our custom queries um, and we can reuse this function across our, uh, our UI framework. And Apollo client comes with, comes with this hook support natively and it was super easy for us to like use it in React. And uh, one other thing is, so GraphQL queries are all posts. So uh, when you see a RESTful API, there are a few different uh, like states, right? Like get, post, delete, put, uh, and mostly GraphQL queries are all post. Um, and uh, so, so what happens is uh, because of that, uh, we GraphQL queries can become really large, and uh, the uh, the size of the query string that we pass over the network. For example, when a browser is requesting data through GraphQL, uh, we do a post and we say that okay, this is the query. Uh, give us these data attributes uh, from the server back, right? So if the query is like really big, the, uh, the size that we are transferring over the network uh, to the server to get the data back can also get bloated. And this can actually cause performance uh, issues. And uh, Apollo actually like uh, has, this, uh, has this thing called automated persistent queries. And it allows us some caching using get with CDN. And uh, it also like has this, uh, uh, technology where it uh, creates this unique identifier using a hash and uh, the client can just send this hash instead of the whole query string. So the way it works is like this. So we have our client app. It, uh, it first sends a, uh, a hash of a query string to execute to the server and uh, the string is not there on the server. So it, it responds with an error. So the client app sends the query string and the hash, and the server basically persists the query and the hash and returns the response. And the next time as the time passes, the client app can now just send the hash and the hash, since the hash is persisted in the server, uh, it's easier for the server to find that, oh, this hash already exists in our cache. So, Here's the response that you requested for, for your uh, hash ID. And uh, every time we don't have to send the whole query to the uh, server to execute. Um, so this is uh, one way of uh, 
making sure our queries are optimized and uh, it's uh, it's very performant so so with apollo client caching and graphql uh, we were able to get rid of redux so redux was this state management library that we use on the ui side of things where we request multiple data and then we match all those things together uh, based on our ui requirements all those things were gone we we, we didn't need that anymore uh, we only needed the uh, um, like since we use graphql we only got the data that we requested and everything was already cached so we didn't need to like massage the data ourselves so that was great for us one less of a framework to manage so data modeling in uh, apollo graphql server so we already have this rest api working and we wanted to like move to this new graphql server so the first thing that we did was to model the data like based on uh, how the ui needed it so as an example um, in this in this particular case we are on the on the left side we are instantiating an apollo server with uh, with the api data source and the cache and uh, on the left side bottom we are having a having the structure of a cart of what a cart cart response would look like for example uh, in an e-commerce site uh, get me a cart ID with ID one two three or something uh, for a particular user, right? So um, we can send the ID, and uh, the cart will give us back. Okay, these are the line items in your cart, and this is the summary. This is the item count. So we basically shape the data like how we need it, and uh, we write we uh, we write all those things in the server. And on the right side, we make a call to the API, and uh, we 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 reduce it in a in a function. All the data is basically um, returned in an object form to the client side, and we basically do some modeling of the data. So in this case, we are modeling a cart request and a response uh, so that the UI can receive it. So that's that's pretty much what's happening here, and uh, we also paired paired it with Redis cache. So every time um, we don't go to the database to look up what is the value uh, for a particular uh, query and its response, we look at the Redis cache, and uh, and we have a uh, cache control of five minutes. Uh, so that after five minutes the cache automatically expires and we use redis cache to like uh, look up the data really quickly on the server so uh, that's about apollo graphql and uh, what is cloudflare so the cloudflare is basically a web infrastructure platform it provides us with solutions like dns um, like CDN and uh, like firewall, uh, edge computing, and uh, workers. The Cloudflare workers are basically like any code that you can write on the Cloudflare platform, and uh, we can uh, request data from any application server. We can reroute data, like we can reroute requests to any application server. So. Cloudflare basically like provides us with all these different capabilities. And uh, I think we saw this like earlier. So initially our uh, monolithic code base was like this. So the browser makes a request to request to get, let's say a collection page. Hey, give me, uh, give me uh, the collection page 
and it goes through Cloudflare, goes to the monolithic uh, like code base, and uh, and the monolithic code base sends back the HTML, and it goes to the browser, and uh, once the HTML is there, the browser can now um, like request any like restful data it needs, and uh, and the monolithic uh, code base responds with the um, API response uh, that the browser needs. This is how it was. We introduced two, two new layers on the server side. One is web and Apollo GraphQL. And uh, the workers in between you see, we used it to manage like, okay, which server gets the request. And uh, so what happens is the first request goes to web and then and then from the web it goes to the browser and the browser now requests graphql data and the graphql data goes to the graphql server and now the graphql server requests the data from the monolithic uh, server and then that particular server sends back the response required and that particular response go to the goes to the browser so uh, it's a little additional work, but uh, since we are incrementally moving things, uh, we have to create separate layers in order to uh, in order to give each particular layer a specific purpose. So that's what we did here, and uh, we created dedicated Cloudflare workers. So when I say workers, it's uh, um, it's all basically just like programmable logic. Uh, we can do a, do certain things uh, on the Cloudflare level. We had like uh, we had like dedicated workers. We had a default worker, Apollo worker, asset worker, and so on. Apollo worker handles all the GraphQL requests. The default worker handles all the uh, incoming requests, and the asset worker basically manages things like images, any videos, and things like that. So uh, this is this is what it looks like. We can compose, we can create one function and we can compose multiple functions inside it. So in this case, we see a handle request function and it is composed of like multiple functions. Uh, so one is like fetching the request. We can also do geolocation. We can geolocate where a user uh, is coming from. Uh, we can also write any logic that you want here so that's the beauty of uh, workers. And uh, this is basically edge computing. This is all happening on the edge servers. And uh, we can respond back with any data that we need. So in, in this case, we, like I said before, um, we, we revamped our check, we, we revamped, revamped our collection pages, product pages, and home pages and uh, we created all these different paths so anytime anytime a user requests our page on a mobile phone uh, it goes through this path it checks if it is a mobile phone it checks if the request is for a let's say a home page or a product page or a collection page um, it, it checks all these things and it on the right side when you see um, it after checking all these things on the edge level, it then decides, okay, uh, should I pass along this request to the newly created servers which run on Next.js and GraphQL, or should we uh, redirect this request to our old monolithic, like monolithic server that we already have? So this particular decision making logic is being handled in this layer in this edge server layer so that is what we are doing here and uh, this is how we can incrementally uh, like decide in incrementally even like re-architect an existing application uh, rather than like like creating everything from scratch so this is the the crux of like how to uh, how to create new servers, how to decide which server the traffic should go to, 
uh, and all those things. All those things are being handled here. So all, for example, if someone is coming from a desktop, a desktop device, since we did not pre-architect that initially, all the requests that are, that are coming from a desktop device would go to the old, uh, the, the old monolithic architecture server. So uh, none of the requests will be, um, you know, uh, sent to the new ones. In the new ones, we are we are only re-architecting the, the the mobile, uh, the mobile side of things. So, and uh, this is how an Apollo worker looks like. So if the request come, that is coming in has slash GraphQL, then uh, this particular worker will uh, take in charge, take control, and will return back the response to the client that is requesting the, uh, the data. And uh, we, can, we also wrote a percentage-based split at the edge. So when it comes to like pushing this newly architected e-commerce side to production, we didn't want to uh, put this uh, new application in front of 100% traffic. So we created this logic where uh, we decide how much percentage of the traffic are we going to let in initially, um, and then slowly ramping it up to 100%. So, uh, just because it was easy for us to like um, diagnose and detect if there are any issues as we are increasing the traffic to our site. So we create this like small logic uh, where we decide, okay, so how much percentage of traffic are we going to allow? And we put it in the edge server um, and that basically handles um, like uh, the math for that. And we also use an environment variable so that we don't have to like go in and write uh, or like write code every single time to increase the traffic. We also use environment variables. So all we have to do is go to the config and uh, we can just change. Okay, so now allow 50%, now allow 70%. Um, so we don't have to like, um, like write or deploy code. Uh, everything was handled in a config. That is what is a CF underscore uh, env underscore var here uh, takes care of. So some some handy performance management tools. So we use the speed curve for looking at uh, looking at what is the LCP. If you remember the longest contentful paint. Uh, so the things the the web vitals that uh, an e-commerce site or any particular website requires. And uh, you can also open up Chrome Profiler. Just right click. Uh, open debugger. Uh, you can uh, take a look at the the Chrome profiler. It will show you like uh, which uh, which file is taking the long time and why is it. Uh, you can take a look at all those things. And we also take a, took a look at the Next.js build metrics, like what is the uh, bundle size that is being sent when a page loads, and uh, the Webpack bundle analyzer is. Uh, is basically a pictorial representation of like, okay, these are all your bundles on your page. These are all the sub bundles. It's a, it's a very interesting uh, pictograph. So what we have created so far, we have created a next year server to handle all the incoming requests for the new paths. And uh, we also created an Apollo GraphQL server to handle all the GraphQL requests and we have the monolithic remainder and we created cloud pair workers to tie up all these layers together and decide which request goes to which server so that's what we have done so far so so some of the replatforming um, and performance takeaways that we had uh, it was easier to maintain the code base in the new technologies in Next.js. And it was uh, easier to form performance-driven teams, actually. Uh, so you can even, you can, within the company, we were able to even like assign teams to work on uh, like specific things. Uh, 
so it's called adopting convoys law and uh, um, the the front end and uh, the back end had independent deployments so we didn't have to depend upon like for example when we make a change uh, we didn't have to like build both front and back end at the same time since we have segregated these two things it was uh, easier to have independent deploys and uh, uh, our phased approach was much much easier than having a full full revamp and uh, it was easier to estimate how long it was going to take and get management buy in and uh, some transient challenges that we had along the way we had to make sure that we do a stateless handoff to the monolith uh, which means that when we pass the request to the from the new application to the old application we have to make sure that we uh, the the new the the old application is able to get all the data from the back end rather than depending upon uh, some uh, unwired information along the way and uh, uh, some challenges are like we have to update in like three different places since we have like three different servers one is for Next.js, one is for GraphQL, and one is for uh, the the monolithic uh, code base we have to kind of sometimes update all three places initially but it, it's kind of like a transient thing until we uh, make it all into like um into like into the new technology stack and uh, making servers communicate with each other is a very daunting task to be honest we have to make sure that we pass all the cookies and like all the states along with the requests so it was a little challenging and uh, we need to run like three servers on our local environments which is kind of okay compared to like dealing with uh, like a very old architecture and uh, what does the future look like uh, currently um, actually we have already created this uh, checkout with the responsive design and uh, there's this new concept called incremental static site generation uh, which is uh, which is quite interesting um, all the paths can be dynamically um, generated and saved on the server and when a client requests data the server can just instantly uh, instantly respond and give the uh, already generated path and uh, we are exploring more edge computing uh, if we can even bundle the whole front end and deploy it on the edge server itself it will be like super fast better than application servers because um, edge servers have better uh, distribution networks and uh, uh, we are also like looking at microservices so if uh, we should create separate microservices for um, any particular um, endpoint that we have like like sign in and like login is a good microservice to have and uh, uh, webpack federation is another uh, new concept that has come up um, it uh, it basically this this one is pretty interesting because it it actually allows you to have a mono repo but actually not even you can have a mo you can you can still run a mono repo with like segregated um, like like code bases it's kind of like crazy but take a look at that and react server components is another new thing that has come up uh, and uh, actually that's all i had to be honest like uh, i want to thank all my peers who worked on this project and uh, i hope you learned something about monolith today and about re-architecting it and uh, yeah I, um, I i want to see all of you to like you know um, uh, make applications and uh, try all these new web technologies out there and uh, when you do uh, 
uh, tag me on Twitter or LinkedIn. I would love to hear your story. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's it from me. Thank you so much. That was an awesome webinar we had. We now open the floor for Q&A from students, please. Also, feel free to ask me any uh, basic questions if I had uh, moved too fast. I'm, I'm very sorry, but feel free to ask me any questions. Yeah, the participants. Ah, Naval, I have to. Ma'am. Ah, yes, I'm Priya Kailan, Kailan, yes. Ah, OK, ma'am. Now it's really the profession of good. All the partners you have uh, so, intending to work in GraphQL now. Uh, my one of my research hmm. scholar, uh, she was like, she wanted to work in GraphQL. And uh, I, the one thing I want to ask you is, can we use as the standalone? Uh, like Apollo, uh, you showed one thing, right? Can we use that? Yeah. Alone, and uh, can we proceed with it? Yeah, if I'm understanding your question correctly, ma'am, uh, you're asking if uh, if you if we can use. You just you were just cutting out a little bit. Um, if I'm understanding your question correctly, you're saying. Can we use Apollo GraphQL server as a standalone server, right? Yeah, your voice is dead. Yeah, I'm actually yeah, exactly. typing it. Yeah, you can use it as a standalone server. And uh, so it will be like this. It will be like um, UI code, um, GraphQL server, and uh, database. So it will be like this. It will be sort of like this. Uh, UI code, GraphQL server, and database. And uh, like likewise on the reverse direction as well. Okay. 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 I saw that. Okay. Any other questions from student side? Okay. Okay, Nawaz, I think no questions. Uh, we had a very wonderful session. Thank you. Uh, with Ms. Nawaz. I, I actually, we have well explained with uh, different technologies uh, used for developing more architecture and also how to write a clean code and how to optimize the query to improve the performance of the monolithic systems. And also we explained in very well about web infrastructure platform, how to create the different work as a service. And also explained about uh, how to check uh, the performance of a particular system by using some uh, different management tools. Uh, it, uh, it was very uh, wonderful and a useful session. Uh, was. So oh, so thank you, Madam. Thank you. Um, uh, I thank thank you, Madam. Yeah. 
accepting uh, and uh, delivering the wonderful session on monolithic uh, system thank you madam thank you thank you thank you thank yeah you. so so yeah before i go just like one thing i want to say is like i i uh, i highly recommend is going into these uh, github repositories especially uh, the net next js github repositories and uh, um, even the apollo github repositories so the the one thing that has come up is all these repositories have a folder called examples so this is like a new culture that has come up in open source software so repositories now have examples in in their folder so which is like extremely useful uh, along with the documentation so um, like take a look at it read it you will actually gain a lot of knowledge um, and uh, um, like tag people on twitter talk to them uh, it's very easy to like uh, find information and people are ready to help out so uh, yeah i'm always uh, here too so let me know if you have any questions outside of this and thank you so much for the opportunity madam we now move to the next point in the agenda the vote of time Mr. Nawaz Khan, Crescent Aluminium, yes, BTEC IT, 2010 batch, senior engineer, ever in San Francisco, California, USA. Dr. Ganesh, director, Office of Aluminium Relations. Dr. Sadiq Ali, HOD, Department of Information Technology. Dr. Lachomi, associate professor, IT department, alumni, faculty members, guests, and my dear students. On behalf of the Office of Alumni Relations and the Department of Information Technology, it's an immense pleasure to propose the vote of thanks. We thank our expert alumni, Mr. Manawas Khan, Crescent, Alum Crescent Aluminus, BTEC IT 2010 batch, senior engineer Evelyn, San Francisco, California, USA, for taking the time to deliver this webinar. It was indeed a very informative and interesting webinar we had today. We thank you for motivating our students, and I'm sure it was very beneficial to them. Special thanks to Dr. Ganesh, Director of Office Alumni Relations, for his guidance and support in organizing this alumni webinar. We thank Dr. Sathik Ali, HOD Department of Information Technology, for all his support in organizing this webinar. Special thanks to Dr. Lachomi, Associate Professor, IT Department, for all the support extended. We thank all the faculty, students, alumni, and guests for the participation in today's webinar. And we hope that you enjoyed attending this webinar. Thank you, one and all. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, John, sir. <laughs> uh, the special thanks to participants, dear participants, for participating in this webinar. And Eva, I hope you will benefit from the session. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, Nawaz. Thank you, sir. It's only, sir. Hi, Nawaz. How are you? Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Nawaz Khan, for your wonderful seminar. You know, thank your you. presentation was so clean, so nice. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, I hope our students might have enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And now uh, it's a nice uh, webinar. So actually, uh, I'm in some other work, but parallelly I'm attending. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank uh, you, sir. I'm, I'm I'm really honored, sir. I'm, I'm really honored to see all of you. I'm very humbled to be here today. Extremely happy. Sir. Now it's Prakash. Prakash, sir. I think the audience is your class advisor, no? Yes, yes. I'm the class advisor. Yes, for, uh, class advisor for me. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Namaskar, Prakash sir. Prakash sir also. Who is your class advisor? Prakash sir or Rajendra? Rajendra. Sir, myself sir. Okay, okay, fine, fine. Mr. Nawaz, your presentation was so nice, you know, so clear. I'm really, the department is, you know, indeed happy and proud of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. It's my pleasure, sir. And Prakash sir, hello to you, you too. Hi, I'm happy to see here. I have to run back. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Hope hope you are well, sir. We are fine. How are you? How about your job? Everything is going well, sir. Yes, the job is great. So one more day for the weekend. Tonight is Thursday night here. So 
uh, Friday it is tomorrow. So one more day for the weekend and uh, it's I Halloween think, here. Okay, okay. Almost now it is uh, almost you are nearing to the midnight. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's like it's about to be midnight here. But I'm like I'm actually like uh, extremely uh, thrilled to see you all. So I, I'm not. I I don't think I'll be able to sleep tonight. So. Oh, oh, nice, nice. Okay, thank you, Noah. Uh, uh, anyway, sir, thanks for having me, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll uh, I'll take my leave, sir. Thank you, and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Thank yes, you. sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank sir. You. Done, sir. Thank you, John, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, HOD, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Lachim, ma'am, uh, John, sir, and uh, Sir Nawaz, now I'm going to get so nervous. Thank you. Ah.